The waves crash against the shore as your party disembarks their ship, each step sinking into the wet surf. As their eyes scan the gloomy coast, they cast each other uneasy glances. Something's amiss on this island. Just as they gain their bearings, an unearthly groan echoes over the beach, growing closer and louder. Your group turns to see the dripping corpses of former sailors stumbling towards you. Roll for initiative. In this video, we're going to show you how to run the first encounter, Drowned Sailors, from the D&D starter set adventure, Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. If you're the dungeon master, this one's for you. As your player's characters arrive at Dragon's Rest, a tiny cloister where world-weary people come to seek peace, it could be fun to encourage them to introduce themselves to one another if they haven't done so already. Some might be willing to share their character's life story, whilst others would prefer to keep their true intentions close to their chest. Whatever their choice, it'll be a great way for them to ease into role-playing and get excited for what's to come. Before they head off to explore Dragon's Rest, ask the players what order they want their characters to head towards the shore in. It's a good idea to write this down in your notes so you don't forget. As they approach the cloister by boat, offer a description of what the players can see. You can use map 2 on page 11 of the adventure or the information in Dragon's Rest locations to help you. You also have every DM's favourite tool, your imagination, to bring the area to life and describe the world around you. So have fun with it! Then the Drowned Sailor's encounter begins. As the players are about to leave the beach and head off to Dragon's Rest, they hear noises behind them. You'll see text in blue boxes throughout the adventure meant for you to read out loud to your players. This text describes the wet gurgling sound the players can hear as three zombies shamble towards them. Feel free to bust out your best zombie impression if the mood takes you. The text provided is there for you to lean on or build off of. Don't be afraid to read it as is or to get more creative and add details. Remember, do what's comfortable and fun for everyone, including you. The players now have a choice. Stay and fight or leave the zombies on the beach. As the dungeon master, you'll want to bookmark the zombie entry or stat block on page 48 of the adventure book. You can mention to your group that the zombies are slow movers so that the players know they have some time to decide. This is their first big decision, and as in all of Dungeons & Dragons, there are no wrong answers. If the players choose to stay and fight, get excited, because this is the first time in the campaign that you'll get to say three special words. Words that will come to inspire joy and fear in the hearts of everyone at the table. Roll. Four. Initiative. Initiative is the order in which everyone, including the enemies, takes turns during combat. Each player will roll a d20 and add their initiative modifier from the top of their character sheet, as you can see here. And you'll do the same for each of the three zombies using their stat blocks and add or subtract their dexterity modifier. In their case, that's a minus two. Zombies don't have a lot of get up and go. For example, if the Wood Elf Fighter rolls an 8, they'd then add their plus 3 initiative to that roll for a total of 11. You would then write down the order going from highest to lowest. The highest number will go first. Now, let's run through some examples of how combat might look. Let's say the Rogue goes first. They want to use their short bow to shoot an arrow at a zombie of their choice. They're far away, but they have a clean line of sight on their target. As the DM, you will ask them to make an attack roll. Attack rolls are made using a d20, and their character sheet will say if they get to add a bonus to the roll. As you can see here, the rogue gets to add a plus 5 to this roll. They roll a 14 and add 5 for a total of 19. You then check the zombie's armor class on their stat block, and if their armor class is lower than or equal to the attack roll, then it hits. Since the zombie's armor class is 8, the rogue's attack hits. The rogue now rolls for damage as instructed on their character sheet. In this case, they roll a d6 and add 3 to see how much piercing damage they do to their zombie target. Let's say they roll a 2 and add 3 for 5 points of damage. As the DM, you'll be keeping track of the three zombies' hit points or HP, so you would subtract that from the zombie target and then move on to the next character on your initiative list. Pro tip, 
Give the zombies numbers, letters, or even names so your players know which ones they're aiming at and which ones have already taken the most damage. Some player characters have spells in their arsenal, so let's look at how spell casting works in combat. For this, we'll focus on the High Elf Wizard of the group. Let's say they want to cast Thunder Wave. For this, all targets need to make a constitution saving throw. Thunder Wave affects anyone in front of the person casting, even if they're on the same side. As the DM, you decide who is within 15 feet in front of the caster, depending on where everyone has positioned themselves. Remember, you're also in control of the zombies, so the constitution saving throws of any unlucky sailors within 15 feet of the wizard are yours to make. For this, you would roll a d20 and add the zombies constitution modifier, which you can see here on the stat block is plus three, which is pretty good. To determine whether the saving throw succeeded or not, you'll need to see what the wizard's spell save DC is. It says here on their character sheet that it's 13, so the zombie has to roll 13 or higher than a 13, or they'll take 2d8 thunder damage and be pushed away from the caster. As with many spells, a successful save will still do damage, and if the zombie succeeds with their saving throw, they'll take half as much damage. The player casting the spell rolls the d8s to determine how much damage is done. Next, in the initiative order, we have the zombies, because it's only a fair fight if they get a turn too. As the DM, you'll control all three zombies and get to decide their actions. Take a look at the monster stat block for some inspiration. Here, under actions, we see that the zombies can slam, which is a melee weapon attack. Let's say they choose the rogue as their target. To attack, first roll your d20 and add plus three. Let the player controlling the rogue know the total number so they can compare it with their armor class, which is on their sheet here. Let's say you rolled a 16. Add plus three for a total of 19. The rogue has an armor class of 14, so the attack hits. Now, let's see how much bludgeoning damage the zombie does. As noted in the stat block, you will roll one d6 and add plus one. The rogue subtracts this from their hit points. Not every turn in combat needs to be an attack, and the rulebook contains a list of actions that can be carried out in a turn. Let's say, in this case, the zombies are getting in some pretty good shots and the party is looking a little worse for wear. Good thing there's a cleric in the party to offer some healing. They have the spell Cure Wounds in their repertoire, and because this isn't an attack, they don't need to make an attack roll. This spell and all others are detailed in the rulebook. Make sure the spellcasters have access to the book so they know how their spells work. For this spell, the cleric chooses a target to heal. Let's say they want to help the rogue regain some of that HP they just lost. The cleric rolls 1d8 and adds their spell casting modifier. As it says here on the cleric's character sheet, their magic comes from their wisdom. So the spell casting modifier plus three. So they roll the d8, add three, and that's how many hit points the rogue regains. It's important to mention that a character can only be restored to their original total HP and not beyond that. One other thing it's important to consider when rolling a d20 is what's called natural ones and natural twenties. A natural one is quite simply when someone rolls a result of a one on a d20 prior to adding any modifiers. This means the attack automatically misses regardless of any bonuses or the target's AC. However, if the d20 roll is a 20, the attack hits regardless of any modifiers or the target's AC. When you roll a nat 20, you get to roll all of the attack's damage dice twice, add them together, and add any relevant modifiers as normal. This is one of the most exciting moments in D&D and can completely turn the tables on even the most challenging encounters. Make sure to celebrate with your players, especially if one of them scored the hit. Everyone loves to feel like a hero. Now, as the DM, continue to work through your initiative list, giving each player and zombie a turn. When you reach the end of the order, Go back to the top and start over. The encounter continues until one of these things happens. The enemies or the party are defeated or the enemies or the party flees. In this instance, it's unlikely the zombies have the sense to flee and they're not as hard to defeat as you or the party might think. As noted on their stat block, they have undead fortitude, which means if they're brought to zero hit points, they have the chance to reanimate. Players might not immediately figure out what has happened here, if you notice that they're puzzling over why a defeated zombie is getting back up to his feet, don't be afraid to drop a hint or two 
and help them figure it out. Is there a member of the party that might know about zombies or has seen them before? Get them to roll an ability check, maybe intelligence to represent recalling information, and then give them this invaluable information. Or put emphasis on the zombie getting back up seemingly unharmed. Dungeons & Dragons is a collaborative game, and the Dungeon Master plays with the rest of the players, not against them. It's okay to give as much information as you want to keep things fun and interesting. Now, as with all combat encounters, there is always the chance your players won't be victorious. But the most important thing here is that everyone has fun. In Dragons of Stormwreck Isle, the players have a secret weapon, in this case, in the arrival of Runara, a powerful ally who can whisk the battered party to safety, as detailed under Runara's aid in the adventure book. That's just one example of how combat could go, but what happens if your creepy zombie impression is so good the players decide to run away? Given the party is clearly faster than the zombies and the zombies won't chase after them, there's no need to roll for success or failure. They simply get away, for now. What does this mean for the zombies? Well, that's up to you as the DM to decide. Maybe they stumble in on the party at a later time or in another encounter. For now, it's off to Dragon's Rest. So there you have it. How to run the first of many exciting encounters in the Dragons of Stormwreck Isle adventure. No two D&D games will ever be the same, and that's what's so fun about it. Remember, you have the rulebook and adventure book to guide you, but when in doubt, just make it up. The most important rule to remember is to have fun. So good luck and happy adventuring.